Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's debate. My name is Matt Zulinski. I am a professor of philosophy here at the University of San Diego and director of USD's Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy, uh, which is sponsoring this afternoon's debate. The mission of the center is to promote a better understanding of social and political issues by bringing together ideas in a way that transcends traditional disciplinary and ideological boundaries. We do that through a number of events, including a biannual debate series. We have one debate on a big issue of public policy each semester. Uh, and then we also sponsor a number of smaller events, panels on different issues of public policy. Our topic for today is socialism. For most of the last century, it was simply unimaginable that any politician who self-identified as socialist in the United States could achieve any kind of serious political success. But things may be starting to change. Bernie Sanders' 2016 bid for the presidency generated tremendous excitement among voters, especially among young voters. And the success of Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's 2018 bid for Congress suggests that excitement for democratic socialism is both lasting and not limited to the personality of one individual. Indeed, according to a Gallup poll published in August of last year, a majority of Democrats no longer hold a positive view of capitalism, while nearly 60% of them do have positive feelings towards socialism. So our question for tonight is, is socialism the wave of the future for the United States? What are the best moral and economic arguments in favor of socialism? And what do the ablest defenders of capitalism have to say in response to those arguments? And what, while we're at it, does the idea of socialism even mean today in our current political system? As always with these debates, our goal for you this afternoon is to present you with the best arguments on both sides of the issue. This is not a contest to see who can win by scoring the most rhetorical points against the other side. It is, at least as I conceive of it, a collaborative search for truth. Uh, one that will enable you to walk away with a better understanding of your own position, whatever that might be, with a better understanding of the other side's position, and with a better understanding of where those two positions differ, and just as importantly, where they converge. I'm grateful to the support of the University of San Diego for making this debate possible, to the Institute for Humane Studies, which has helped provide financial and logistical support for this event, and to the supporters of the Center for Ethics, Economics, and Public Policy, including Charles Wax and James Brennan, who have joined us here this afternoon. And it is now my great pleasure to introduce our two debaters. Michael Munger is Professor of Political Science, Economics, and Public Policy at Duke University and a leading scholar in the field of public choice. In addition to 200 articles and papers published in professional journals and edited volumes, Professor Munger has seven books including Choosing in Groups, published in 2015, and most recently, Tomorrow 3.0, Transaction Costs and the Chairing Economy. Vivek Chibber is professor of sociology at New York University, the editor of Catalyst, a journal of theory and strategy published by Jacobin Magazine, the author of Postcolonial Theory and the Specter of Capital, and also the ABCs of Capitalism, some copies of which might be available outside uh, after the debate. All right, so our format for this evening, each speaker will have 15 minutes to present their opening argument. After that, they will have five minutes uh, to rebut uh, the other side's opening argument. And then we will turn to a brief period of moderated discussion and then open question and answer period. So without any further delay, I'm going to turn things over to our first debater, Vivek Chipper. Uh, thanks, uh, Matt, and thanks all of you for coming. It's true that, uh, at least in my lifetime, uh, I not only have never seen such a question posed in a public setting, but I was absolutely sure I never would. Uh, the fact that it is says something about how the political culture has shifted in this country quite dramatically and in a very short period of time. So that being said, uh, let me get to the point. The question is, is it time for the United States to embrace socialism? And any meaningful answer to that requires first a definition of what we mean by that so that we know, all know that we're on the same page. I will take socialism now to mean two things. A set of principles uh, about what is good and bad, fair and unfair in the world, and then a set of institutions to further and that to embody and institutionalize those principles. 
I think for socialists, there are three main principles that uh, most of them can agree upon. And I'm going to say these in a, in a kind of minimal way. Uh, minimally, all socialists agree, first of all, that the market should not be the arbiter of people's fate, their well-being, so it has to be constrained in some way. For some socialists, that means abolishing the market altogether. For other socialists, like myself, it means simply reducing its scope. Secondly, economic decision makers, people who actually are holding investable funds, the wealth-creating funds of society, they have to be democratically accountable in some way so they don't have unilateral power over people's lives. And thirdly, that the inequalities in wealth and income should not be uh, allowed to translate into inequalities in political power. That is, politics should, as, as much as possible, be a domain in which people participate with more or less uh, equal resources and equal say, which massive inequalities in wealth tend to undermine. So those are the three principles that I think socialists agree upon. Now, what about the institutions that embody this? Well, again, there's a few here that I think uh, all socialists can agree upon. First of all, a significant expansion of the welfare state so that the, at the very least the basic needs of people are provided to them on a decommodified basis. What we mean by decommodified basis is your ability to acquire essential goods for your livelihood and for your well-being shouldn't depend on your performance in the labor market, whether or not you have a job, how good the job is, how much money you have, those sorts of things. Second, a massive increase in taxation on economic and wealth so that the material inequalities between people and society can be reduced. Uh, the justification for this tends to be of a, uh, many kinds, but at the very least, what it means is it will reduce the extent of political inequalities, and it also increases the likelihood of some kind of social solidarity in society, a sense of community, which vast inequalities tend to rip apart. And that sense of community is important to hold together the institutions of a fair and a just society. And thirdly, simply uh, either taking out of the market or massively regulating uh, what's called the commanding heights of the economy. Uh, this means things like infrastructure, healthcare, banks, finance, uh, these sorts of things which uh, are the pillars on which a modern capitalist society runs. So these are the basic institutional requirements, I think, for what a feasible socialism will be. The extent to which we move forward on them varies from socialist to socialist, but all agree on basically reducing the scope of the market increasing the scope of planning, and reducing the ability for people with lots of money to have lots of political influence as well. All right, that's what I'm going to mean by this. So the question then, again, is it time for the US to embrace socialism? The answer is a resounding yes. It is indeed that time. And now I should, I'm going to try to give you some arguments as to why that's the case. The main reason we say on the left that it's time to embrace socialism is simple. It's that an unfettered market, an unregulated and uncontrolled capitalist economy significantly reduces the autonomy of individuals and their ab ability for self-determination. This is the fundamental goal that socialists and Marx have had in spite of these monstrosities like Stalinism, in spite of all the crimes that the Bolshevik regime committed. The goal that always motivated and uh, inspired socialists or people to socialism was what Marx called uh, organizing human arrangements to maximize the chances for human flourishing. And what human flourishing requ uh, requires more than anything else is autonomy, self-determination. And the market, socialists say, while it does uh, at times and in certain ways provide opportunities for autonomy, it is also the domain of a massive concentration of economic power which squelches the autonomy of the vast majority. Now, how does it do that and why? Well. There are many markets. There's not a market in capitalism. So when we say the market does this, what do we mean? Well, whatever other market there is in capitalism, for whatever goods you have a market for, the one defining element of a capitalist economy is a market for labor power, what we call the labor market. Now, the main difference between libertarians and socialists really comes down to their conceptualization, their understanding of how the labor market works. In the left's understanding of the labor market, it is a, not a domain for the unfettered exercise of free choice. Indeed, it is a domain where there is a massive concentration of power and a massive inequality between the uh, leverage and the bargaining options between employer and employee. Because in the labor market, employers have enormously more resources and more power than their employees, they are able to set the terms of the labor exchange in a way that benefits them and typically benefits them that in a, in a fashion that constrains not just the autonomy of their employees, but does so to their detriment, to the detriment of their well-being. How? 
employees, the, the fundamental, uh, the various aspects of the labor contract are set by the employer. And what this means is the employer has power to set wages, working hours, how long the employee is going to work for him, the working conditions. That involves things like safety. It involves things like the pace of work. And finally, of course, because the employer has control over 8, 10, 12 hours of the employee's life while he or she is at the workplace, it also gives the employer indirect control and influence over the employee's life outside the workplace. Because of the exhaustion, because of the enormous physical costs that uh, very fast paces of work, long hours uh, imposes on the employee, it means when they're away from the workplace, much of their time is spent simply recuperating, getting ready to work again. For many employees today, underwork is a major problem because employers want maximum flexibility in how much time any given employee works for them, which means that employees now on any given day don't know when they're going to be called in, which obliterates the very idea of free time because what they're doing most of the time is either sitting by the phone in case their employer calls or because they're not getting enough hours at one venue, they have to seek out other employment. With other employment means they have to be now on the phone waiting for two employers to call them. What this means is the entire life of the employee is essentially colonized by the employer. This is because the employer calls the shots of when you work, how, how long you work, and in what fashion you work, not the employee. Now, this concentration of power in the last 50 years we've seen also breaks the connection, which is the, many people think is an essential component of economic justice. It breaks the connection between effort and reward. Because employers have the power to make first call on whatever revenues their uh, employment, their, their firm, or their establishment is getting, the employers set the terms on how much the employees will get and how much they will get. In conditions where employers have unfettered power, which is what the United States has had the last 50 years, it means that the, uh, the proportion of the total income that goes to the owner of a venue or the CEO increasingly has very little connection to their actual contribution. So 40 years ago, CEOs in the United States earned money in proportion to their employees to the ratio of like 35 to 1. By 2000, it had gone up to 350 to 1, 380 to 1. Now, it's inconceivable, if you follow marginal productivity theory, that CEOs suddenly were, were contributing 10 times more to the product than their workers were. There was one and only one reason why their pay went so much, uh, increased so much faster than their employees, power. They could simply call the shots and take all the money for themselves, whether directly through the, uh, the revenues of the firm or through the stock market. Now, this being the case, it means that the essential promise that the market makes to people, which is if you work hard, you will get the returns, the market itself is, in fact, undermining. And finally, in politics, the massive concentration of wealth, the massive concentration of economic resources translates into a massively greater influence in political power. This I should not have to, by now, rehearse, but let me just say the basic facts. Most working people know this. Opinion polls show that for the past 50 years, the majority of the American population has felt two things, that the political system is unresponsive to them and the political system is captured by the wealthy. When asked directly, as late as 2015, 80% of Americans said the American government favors the rich more than it favors the poor. The result, cynicism. Half the American electorate opts out of American elections and it's, by and large, the poorer half. They feel that the system's been captured. The reason Bernie Sanders' campaign has taken off the way it has is because for the first time in 100 years, a political a, camp, a major politician in this country is saying it doesn't have to be this way. The poor working people have as much right to have an influence in the political system as, as what he says, the millionaires and billionaires. Yeah. <laughs> I only have 15 minutes. So I will not read you the litany of numbers that tends to be overwhelming, but you should, I'm sure you all know by now the story of the last 40 years. For the first time in American history, real wages have been stagnant for two generations. There's this famous graph, it looks like an alligator's mouth. What it shows is trends in productivity increases aligned with trends in real wages. What you've seen since 1973 in this country is that productivity increase has gone up rapidly while real wages have been almost stagnant. And what that means is almost all the increase in income has gone to the top 10% of this population. What the most recent research shows is that 85% of all the income increases since 1980 have gone to the top 10%. The, net, the bottom 90% has had to share 
15% of the increase in productivity. The bottom 50% has gained nothing. Working hours have gone up. Why? Wages are stagnant. Of course working hours have gone up. As working hours grow up, what happens? Inju injuries increase. Fatigue increases. For the first time since World War I, the lifespan of the typical white male in the United States has gone down. Why? The main reason that's given? Despair. Their pensions have, been, have disappeared. Their retirement has disappeared. They're in their 40s to 60s. They can't get new jobs. There's no one looking out there for them. Despair has led to the opioid, opioid crisis, a drugs crisis, and a health crisis. All right, well, all of these things have been accompanied, of course, by a quite uh, dramatic capture of political power by the wealthy. The numbers on that are, are also clear. All right, so this is the background against things like the Sanders campaign, things like Ocasio-Cortez, the, the coming back of socialism into the political agenda. So what does it mean? I very airily gave you some ideas of what it meant earlier. Let me now be more specific. One thing it does not mean is the Soviet-style, one-party state, centralized planning that we saw in the communist world from the Bolshevik Revolution into the 1970s. Very few people on the left advocate for that anymore. Why? Well, first of all, obviously, it is the opposite of self-determination when you have a one-party autocracy ruling over you. Secondly, maybe centralized planning can work, but there's no evidence that it can. We've seen no evidence for it. So what most socialists will now argue for is not that model of socialism. What they will argue for is setting up institutions that will enable the, the principles that I enunciated later to be, inst to be instantiated. What, are, what will those institutions mean? Well, First of all, I think, I said earlier, taking massive sections of the economy out of the commodified zones and making their goods available on a decommodified basis. What are these? I think a viable socialism has to mean a government-run system of several parts of the economy. One is healthcare. Healthcare should not be left up to the private sector. Second, education. There should be Education is not a place for the private sector. Right now, we're still in the midst of this craze around charter schools. There is no evidence that charter schools consistently do better than public schools, and most of them are actually funded on public monies anyway. It's a complete boondoggle. There should not be any private, uh, se uh, privately funded uh, primary and secondary education. Thirdly, housing. Housing should be a social right. Cheap, affordable, and good housing should be provided by the government, not the slums that they've been building for the last 80 years. Half of Hong Kong lives in public housing. It's hardly something like Cabrini in Chicago. It is good housing, and there's no reason why you can't have good housing provided by the state. Transportation, there's, of course you can have cars. Of course you can have your own. But every major city should have good, cheap, and high-quality public education. And there, in the United States, there needs to be a viable national system of rail transport. And if you ask me, these airlines should be nationalized yesterday. Privately, media, privately funded media is dying. It won't exist a few years from now because the traditional model of media finance, which was advertising based, is collapsing. Advertisers have, have now bolted from print media. They're never coming back. They bolted from television. They're never coming back. If there's going to be a future for media in this country, it's only going to come through a massive influx of public monies into it, massive influx of some kind of public support for it, so that's another sector that I think should be, uh, in substantial measure, uh, be given over to the public sector. Uh, public utilities should not be privately run. Public utilities were, for decades on end, public entities, and they should go back to being public entities. All right, what does that leave? Quite a bit. It means a lot of what you consume privately. It means a lot of consumption goods, restaurants, movies, a lot of entertainment is still gonna be privately run in the model that I'm saying. But it's not trivial that you'll have taken out more than half of this G country's GDP from the commodified sector into some kind of government um, provision. That necessarily means some conception of planning as well. There's going to be some degree of planning that goes into the provision of these, all these goods. So it does conform in this, uh, in this manner to the traditional conception of what socialism is. Now, these are all the pillars of what it'll be. The second thing a socialist, the, the call for socialism involves then is a question of strategy. If you're planning on taking over, whatever, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent of the economy and making it now publicly provided, you're talking about a fantastic attack on private capital. And they're not going to lie down and take it willingly. 
So any call for socialism also has to be a call for a political strategy. And the essence of that political strategy is that a, a call for socialism involves enabling and creating the institution for the organization and the mobilization of the poor. Historically, every case, whether it's Western Europe, whether it's the Global South, where anything like these institutions were built up that I'm arguing for, it came on the back of a massive and a mobilized labor movement. One reason why in the United States in the past 50 years you've seen a retreat on every one of these fronts is because of the collapse of the labor movement. So part of the socialist strategy, I think part of the call for socialism has to be a political vision that moves away from this idea that it's technocrats and enlightened politicians that simply deliver these goods from on high. It's gonna to have to come through the politics of the, this country reawakening, and in particular reawakening of that sleeping giant, which is the poor, their capacity for social movements, their capacity for social change. If this can be done, if this can come together, I actually think it's not only possible, but it's more or less inevitable that we're gonna see a change in the direction that I'm defending. Thank you. Thank you, Vivek. We'll now turn things over to Professor Michael Munger. Well, hey, thanks very much for having me. Um, I should point out that one of the rules in academics is the smarter you are, the less you have to dress up, which explains why no tie for Vivek. So, <laughs> but I'm going to do my best nonetheless. Now, in some ways, what we're debating is not so much destinations as directions. The country stands at a crossroads. Uh, it happened that I worked as a consultant in the 1989 presidential election in Chile, and that was the first election that had happened since the CIA-assisted coup in 1973. And I remember in the discussions that I saw in 1989 in Chile thinking, I hope I never live in a country where elections are so important. Well, I have bad news. <laughs> Many of us feel like the next election is going to change the world. And I do worry that whoever loses, and someone will, whatever side loses is going to say, I don't accept this outcome. So I worry that this debate over direction is one that we have to try to take seriously and articulate exactly what we mean by our terms rather than approach it in a way that demagogues. I want to compliment Professor Chibber for having done a very good job of being clear. We often debate, although he did not, as if two ideals, market systems and communism, were possible. I, I, let me say that many people on my side seem to have a little shrine of markets that they worship. If you ask them for an example, well, what country do you have in mind? What actual country on earth do you have in mind? They, well, I, that's what would happen. It would happen if we just had markets. And there are people on the left that make the same mistake. If a social system is not feasible at scale, then it cannot be desirable. The idea that we should embrace socialism in the sense of being a Soviet-style, fully planned economy is nonsense. You can't embrace a ghost, and we don't want to embrace a zombie. The question that's posed here, though, is should we embrace socialism more as a direction? That's only interesting if socialism means things we're not already doing that we have not already embraced. Now, those would include, as Professor Chibber said, state ownership and direction of the means of production of a substantial part, in fact, more than half of GDP, and state control of direct and direction of an entire menu of prices, including wages, interest rates, and commodities, so as to ensure that prices conform with democratic and not economic goals. The problem is that there's also no examples of countries that work along those lines. Angola, Cuba, Mozambique, North Korea have such grotesque limits on political freedom and such stunted levels of prosperity, they're not worth considering. If by capitalism you mean the uncontrolled working of prices through markets, then we're, we also don't find any examples of that that we want to pursue. So the point is not whether socialism or capitalism actually exists. Neither of those can be embraced. All existing systems are mixed. What sort of existing system might we try to redirect our own system towards? Now, capitalism uses market prices to direct production. The value of resources and assets and profits are used 
to determine the distribution. So capitalism is a system of production and distribution. Democratic socialism uses votes and bureaucracy to direct production and subsidies and transfers to determine distribution. Those are the choices that are before us. The key reason that socialism is unworkable is that it lacks any kind of price mechanism for signaling the value and opportunity cost of resources. So a system that relies on the price mechanism can't be socialism. And a system that is socialism can't rely on the price mechanism. So the failure to control market forces, including the tendency towards cronyism that we see in the United States, are just as big a distortion of prices. It doesn't matter if some bureaucrat who's educated on the left or if some corporate CEO who recognizes the interests of the right is the one doing the planning, that is the one who is distorting the price system. The effects are just as pernicious. So I expect we agree about that, that that sort of price manipulation is the big danger that we see coming from the right and from cronyism. So here's the thing that I want to propose, and I'm from North Carolina. Every, every October we have a state fair, and at the state fair we have the beautiful pig contest. Now these are always young pigs, but imagine that we were to have a beautiful pig contest for adult pigs. Now we bring out the first of two contestants, there's only two because there's not many pretty pigs. We bring out the first pig and we look at it, oh, that's a really ugly pig. Let's just give prize to the second pig. Well, that's what people on both sides tend to do. They look at the problems with markets and say, therefore, the state should do it. Well, wait, you're comparing the state you can imagine with markets that actually exist. And Lord knows people on the right do this. They point out problems with the state, and then they compare it to the markets that they can imagine. So the, the, the question is to delineate the set of activities that we would like to try to use markets and the, the, the set of activities that we would want to use the state. So what is the argument for capitalism now that we recognize we're comparing two ugly pigs? It's actually simple. Wealth and prosperity is the result of division of labor or specialization that's directed by the price system. Now, division of labor does not require a market system, but division of labor and market systems work well together in a decentralized setting. So we're used to the sort of specialization that was present at the origins of this. If your last name is Cooper, you come from a family that used to make barrels. If you come from a family named Smith, then they made metal products. If you come from a family of bakers, then they made bread. So we're used to this idea of specialization. What happens with specialization is that people develop skills and they become more productive. They also are able to take pride in their work because they have some connection to this profession. The result of that is if I specialize and you specialize, we're creating a system of cooperative mutual exchange where I depend on you. If I'm the baker, I depend on you to be the smith. We can't live without each other. The question is how best to organize that kind of cooperation. The Industrial Revolution was the beginning of the serious application of market organization to the division of labor. And Adam Smith's famous example was the pin factory. And what he pointed out was that if you divide workers from the artisanal making of pins into many little separate steps, you could make hundreds or thousands of times as many pins. And the division of labor is limited by the extent of the market, which means that markets want to be global. The advantage of markets is that they increase the breadth and quality of consumer products and they reduce the price. What markets also do, though, is destroy jobs. Throughout history, what markets have done is destroy jobs because increases in efficiency are going to drive out other companies or other workers who are less efficient. Now, that seems, and it is in fact, destructive. Even proponents of markets call it creative destruction, in fact. The advantage of it was pointed out by Adam Smith as early as 1776 in his example of the woolen coat. In Smith's example of the woolen coat, he noted that people were able to get winter coats that were of a higher quality that would have been available even to royalty just 100 years earlier because the quantity and price, quantity went, went up, quality went up, prices went down, everybody could get woolen coats. 
Downside was that many people who used to make coats that weren't very good no longer had jobs. So there was a big increase in the amount and quality of stuff at lower price that consumers got to have. That meant a substantial reduction in poverty. What capitalism is really good at is reducing poverty, but there was a price to pay, and it was inequality. There's two really different problems that are often conflated, and I want to try to distinguish them here. One is poverty, and the other is inequality. They're not the same thing, and there's often a trade-off between them. The way to end poverty is to enable the poor to enrich themselves so there are no poor. The end to inequality is to destroy wealth so there are no rich people. If your primary concern is about inequality, then the, the, the goal is to destroy. If your primary goal is to solve the problem of poverty, your primary goal is to create. It's tempting to think, why not both? The problem is that doing both at the same time is not easy. Since the pro-market reforms of Deng, Deng Xiaoping in 1978, China has seen two enormous changes. First, the largest decline in poverty in history. The largest decline in human poverty in history. More than 500 people by market reforms were lifted out of extreme poverty as China's poverty rate fell from 88% in 1981 to 6.5% in 2012. 88% poverty in 1981, 6.5% poverty in 2012. Now, that's using poverty in a way that's comparable, the equivalent of US $2 less or per day. What went along with that decline in poverty? The biggest increase in inequality that the world has ever seen. China has by far the most unequal political system in the world. If you ask poor people in China who've seen a dramatic increase in their living standard, in many cases 1,000% or more in purchasing power parity terms, a lot of them are going to likely say that increased inequality was worth it because the reduction in poverty really improved their lives. Really, really poor people tend not to be so concerned about inequality. They're concerned about poverty. The question is, at, one po at what point are we not willing to accept the inequalities that are created by this system? Now, remember, by socialism, I mean a system that relies on state ownership or control of the means of production, the state direction of production decisions over a substantial, not all, but over a substantial part of the economy. Ownership solves a problem of the commons. Political incentives are often very short run, and we often hear about the problems in markets that corporate CEOs have very short run goals. Well, if you're in the U.S. House of Representatives, how long are your goals? Two years on November 9th. That's on November 9th. Political systems, likewise, have very short-term goals because they're focused on the next election. If you look at the patho pathologies of the US system, the failure to build infrastructure, the failure to address climate problems, maybe it's because it's controlled by the wealthy, but more likely, it's the very short-run goals that elections induce in democracy. These are two ugly, ugly pigs. Let's look at, let's make a comparison with Sweden. Now, I should point out that one of the things that these debates often look like is two amoebas trying to reach out a pseudopod and envelop Sweden. <laughs> because Sweden is the country that I would point to as being the best example of how capitalism can work. And if you look, in 1990 or so, Sweden had a very substantial proportion of its total GDP that was provided by state-owned enterprises. But their growth was low, and they decided that because of failing industries, a lot of labor market regulations that made firing difficult or impossible, huge increases in labor costs, Gunnar Myrdal, the Nobel Prize winner, famously asked whether Swedes had been turned into a, nature of, a nation of swindlers. Sweden, Sweden's economy was doing very poorly. The situation of debt and stagnation was getting worse. They turned back towards capitalism. At present, Sweden is the 19th most capitalist country in the world. If we measure that based on property rights, trade openness, freedom to use stock to create new corporations, there are more billionaires per capita in Sweden than there are in the United States by a lot. 
So by that measure, at least, inequality is very high in Sweden. But there's a lot less poverty. Sweden has a lot less poverty because they have used their capitalist system to create a surplus that allows them to redistribute to take care of the problem of poverty. The price they have paid is inequality. But that's a price worth paying because the inequality created by capitalism allows us to solve the problem of poverty in a way that nothing else does. So it was capitalism that saved Sweden. Sweden was heading downward. They were having problems with economics. They moved back to the point where they're actually in the top 10 of many measures of capitalism. Sweden is, and if you talk to someone in Sweden, you talk to Swedish government officials, they'll say, I don't know what y'all are talking about. We are a market economy. The, the, the different systems that Sweden uses are, without exception, a market economy. Sweden has a 100% universal voucher system for education. So forget charter schools. It's a voucher system. It is purely privatized. That may be a bad idea, but that's Sweden. They have a purely privatized pension system. They went from defined benefit to defined contribution that's assigned to individuals. The, it's invested in one of 700 private index funds. As the Prime Minister of, of Norway also supposedly a socialist nation said, the Nordic model is an expanded welfare state which uses capitalism to provide a high level of security for its citizens. But it's a successful market economy with much freedom to pursue your dreams and your lives as you wish. That was the prime minister of Denmark. So in terms of deregulation, business freedoms, Denmark, Finland, and Norway are seventh, eighth, and ninth most free. Sweden is 12th. The US is 15th. Those countries are the capitalist countries. If you want to embrace socialism, and what you mean is capitalism, let's do that. But those are capitalist countries. If you want to move in the direction of the Northwest European states, you are saying that we should embrace capitalism. And the reason to do it is that we can use capitalism to create the surplus that will help us solve the problems of inequality. So, I want to sum up, and if you only remember one thing from what I'm going to say today, it should be this. Every flaw in voters is worse than consumers. Forgive me. Every flaw in consumers is worse than voters. Every flaw in consumers is worse than voters. That is, there are people who are too stupid to be able to decide what size Coke to drink. If we gather them into a large unorganized mob, they can decide foreign policy. Because it's the same people. They don't have very good institutions to enable them to enact the sort of social movements that I agree completely with Professor Chirber is what we need. What we need to do is embrace democracy. We don't need to embrace socialism. What we need to do is embrace democracy. Now that may just be sour grapes. I was a 2008 governor candidate for the Libertarian Party in North Carolina. I was included in four televised debates, but I found it very difficult to be, to, to be allowed to participate in politics with the two state-sponsored parties who find competition very inconvenient, if we had a system that actually allowed competitive parties, if we had a system that allowed proportional representation, if we had a system that encouraged political competition, the problem is not the lack of economic competition, the problem is the lack of political com competition. All we need to do is embrace democracy and we'll be able to solve a great deal of this problem. And the other thing that I want to say is that we don't need to embrace socialism. Capitalism saved Sweden, and now Sweden can save capitalism. The Swedish model is the way to save capitalism. What we need to do is embrace democracy. Thanks for listening. All right, we turn now to the rebuttal portion of the debate. So each of our speakers will have five minutes to address what the other person has said. Five minutes, and after that time, I will glare at you very sternly. I am smarter, and it's true, I won't wear a tie. <laughs> I am blown away that my libertarian colleague is now advocating for Swedish style social democracy. If that's what the right wants to push for in this country, sign me up. 
I'm all for it. This is where we've come. The political culture in the last 10 years, fantastic, Mike. I, I think we agree on most everything, I, it turns out. Let me make a couple of points here, which I, I, do, I do feel that are important. Um, Mike says the main problem with markets is manipulation of prices, that prices is left to their own, rationally allocate resources in society, and they are, in fact, able to bring about a division of labor, which in the Smithian sense, like an invisible hand, maps the production of goods onto what people's needs are. Um, this is distorted when there's a manipulation of prices. Well, that's not really true. It's also the case that an, a functioning price system leads to perverse incentives. And as a welfare economist realized by the, as, late, as early as the 1950s and later, there can be a massive difference between private profits, private benefits, and, or rather, private returns and social returns. A very good example. In this country, over the last 10 years, there has been a series of givebacks to corporations. Donald Trump's tax breaks most recently are a great example. The very easy monetary policy, the changing of investment laws to, on the assumption that when corporations are given full freedom of their investment activities, what they will do is take these funds to the most, the highest returns, and that will have enormous social returns, et cetera, et cetera. What has happened over the past 10 years? The rate of return in American industry has gone up massively. The rate of profit has gone up massively. The rate of investment has remained just about flat. They got an enormous ocean of money coming to them, and on a rational calculation of prices, what did they do? Well, most of that money, we know how much now, about 94% went into, what, corporate buybacks of their own shares. What does that mean? It's a fancy word for saying they line their pockets. Okay, this is an example of a rational economic choice made for what markets are supposed to do, increasing private returns, which have had very low social returns. A classic example of a situation in which the market is failing on the very issues on which it's supposed to succeed. So that's one of the rationales for saying that there's got to be a much closer supervision of this stuff, and in some cases, taking out some of these decisions from the market altogether. It is not the case, as Mike says, that the alternative to an autonomous market functioning is bureaucrats setting prices. Sweden, I'm gonna keep coming back to Sweden because he opened the door. In Sweden, a huge panoply of goods, their prices were decided not by bureaucrats, but through bargaining, starting in the labor market. Swedish prices of wages, of a whole host of consumer goods, of pensions, of housing, were decided through strong, centralized, collective bargaining, tripartite boards between an organized labor movement and employers, which is what the market is supposed to have. The problem is, in an unregulated, non-unionized market, one party gets to set all the prices. That's the essence of what capitalism is. Mike says, well, what you really care about is eradicating poverty, but if you want to eradicate poverty, it's going to come at a choice, at a cost, which is you're going to have inequality. Chinese example, if you ask the Chinese 400 million or so, you said 500, I think you meant 500 million. Uh, if you, the 500 million who have been raised out of poverty, do they care about inequality? They would say, no, not, that's not true. They would say, yes, but we can't have both, is what they would say. Mike says, yeah, it's true, you can't have both. Again, false. In his favored country of Sweden, for 60 years, you did both. You decreased poverty, and you had the most solidaristic wages, the, most, the highest compression of inequality in the capitalist world. And he's right, it is capitalist, but it is a capitalism of a certain sort. You can't have both. But it requires moving away from the unfettered markets that Mike is advocating for. Lastly, he says capitalism saved Sweden. It's moved to all these new marketized things. Yeah, in the past 12 years it has. But keep one thing in mind. It's moved to them less than the rest of Western Europe, less than Germany, less than England, less than France. Why? Simple reason. It still has 70% union density. There is still an organized working class in Sweden that has prevented a full-scale privatization of all the things that we've seen in England and in Germany go down. If that, the decrease in union density continues apace, you will see Sweden moving further in those directions. And mind you, I was just there a year and a half ago giving a series of talks. It's pretty clear in the labor movement that the, the move to uh, the, uh, the voucher system in schools the privatization of the pension funds, the emergence of a dual labor market, the precarization of work, that is what's behind the rise of the far right in Sweden. 
It is because the working people in Sweden feel that they've been let down by the Social Democratic Party and by the mainstream parties, all of whom are saying to the Swedish working class now, there's nothing we can do. It's the market, baby. Love it or go to, what, Denmark or something. <laughs> the only people who come to them and say, no, no, you deserve a job. You deserve to be protected from what the market can do. Right now is the far right. So there's a cost that's coming, even for Sweden, to embracing all of these market reforms, which is the collapse of the Social Democratic Party, which in the last elections had the lowest showing in 70 years. It's because its voter base now feels they've abandoned us. So yeah, there is still a better alternative to the US, which is Sweden right now. But a better alternative to the Sweden of now is Sweden of 1970. Well, obviously, my claim is going to be the reason that the Sweden of 1970 doesn't work is that the people in Sweden thought that that didn't work, and that's why they went in the direction of capitalism. Let me say there's something we may just disagree about that's more fundamental. The kind of regulation that protects large corporations is not a failure of capitalism. It is a failure of American democracy. I recently wrote a paper called The Road to Cronyism, that's after Hayek's road to serfdom, in which I said capitalism may not be sustainable in a two-party democracy. And the difficulty that we have is that most of our political leaders of both parties are simply bought and paid for by those large corporations. As I wrote in the Georgetown Law Review, I asked the question, is too big to fail too big? Well, yes, it is. So if we look at the companies that should have been broken up to save capitalism on Wall Street, what we did instead was use taxpayer money to bail them out. The very firms that had stolen consumer money through what was effectively a Ponzi scheme in the housing market had money taken from taxpayers and given to them because our democratic system is not capable of making a commitment not to do that. Now, I think organized labor is part of the answer. Donald Trump won a majority of union voters in 2016. Donald Trump won a majority of white women in 2016. The abandonment of labor by the Democrats is catastrophic, but it's not going to come back because neither party seems to be interested in organized labor in the United States. Who received the largest amount of corporate and Wall Street contributions in 2009 in the US House? The answer is Barney Frank. Barney Frank received by far the largest amount of contributions, and then he wrote the Dodd-Frank regu regulation, which benefited the large financial corporations by creating entry barriers that made it impossible for new firms to enter. So Barney Frank's legislation was bought and paid for by those large corporations because our democratic system is not capable of turning those things away. You can't blame a dog for eating out of the garbage but you can't go put in the garbage outside like that. We have a failure of democracy. My own view is that we need to do two things, three things. First, raise taxes. Why would we raise taxes? Well, the answer is we have gigantic deficits, and I think that US policy is daft, D-A-F-T. Deficits are future taxes. What we see is the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth that the United States has ever seen where people who are not yet old enough to vote and probably haven't even been born are paying for my health care. And I'm really rich. Why in the world don't I pay for my own? Or why don't, through taxes, and I don't mean necessarily through private market systems, but why not through taxes? So the first thing is to raise taxes to try to balance the budget. Neither party is concerned about this. We need to invest in education and infrastructure. Instead of just using the money that we have to pay for current consumption, and third, we need to adopt some kind of basic income and single-payer health care. And the reason is that those are better and those are more libertarian than the current things that we have in place. If you look at Obamacare, the opposition to Obamacare should have come from the left, having the, the large insurance companies dominate this. Is that a failure of capitalism? You can't blame dogs for eating out of the garbage. Our democratic system is not capable of withstanding, of acting, of actually carrying out the functions that a state needs to do. 
we need to embrace democracy. We don't need to worry about embracing socialism. The problem is not with our economic system. The problem is with our political system. Thank you. <laughs> he's, he's getting dumber. <laughs> so I think you two do agree on a lot, perhaps a surprising amount for uh, many people in the audience. Uh, but rather than kind of support the love fest that's developing here, I'm going to poke at the areas of disagreement, which I think are real between the two of you. Um, so uh, one question I'll direct to, uh, to you, Mike, um, has to do with the nature of productivity in the U.S. economy uh, over the 20th century and early 21st century. Uh, so Professor Chipper made the argument that a lot of that productivity had gone to benefit the already wealthy, that CEO pay had increased dramatically while worker pay had remained relatively stagnant. Uh, so yes, the economy as a whole is getting richer, uh, but the way in which that wealth has been distributed uh, has been A, very unequal, and B, uh, not to much benefit to the working class. Um, First of all, is that an accurate characterization of what you said? Uh, how, how would you respond to those arguments? Well, he was careful to say wages, and that's right. If you look at total compensation, the difference is much smaller. What is the most expensive thing to working people? And the answer is health care. The cost of their health care increases by 10, sometimes 15% per year. Now, does that benefit them? No, they're no better off than they were in 1970. So that part of the story is right. But the idea that all of the difference in productivity gains is going to capital is just empirically false. What's happened is that our healthcare system is dysfunctional. The United States spends 18 or 19 percent of its GDP on healthcare, and that's in a system where 30 percent don't even have coverage. How can that possibly be when we look at the countries of Northern Europe and see universal healthcare with 9 or 10 percent of GDP? So the answer is our healthcare system has created, it's supposed to be nonprofit. It's nonprofit in the sense that it's not equity finance, but the amount of money that is being poured into our healthcare system, much of the money that working people don't have went in the direction of healthcare. If you look at the costs to um, firms and the cost to workers of healthcare, that's where an awful lot of their total compensation now goes. Now, that's of no benefit to workers, I agree, but it's a different story about the, the power of capital. What we see instead is the power of the healthcare industry as a lobbyist that managed to get through, as I said before, Obamacare. So if you look at total compensation, that alligator's mouth is only open a little bit. It's not that huge, voracious thing into which all the productivity gains have gone. Professor Chibber, did you want to respond to that? No matter how, oh, uh, no matter how you measure it, the fact of the matter is if you look at the work that's coming out from Piketty and Saez and their colleagues, if you just look at income, there's no way around the fact that the vast bulk of the income gains of the past 40 years have gone to the top 1%. And the top 1% is the holders of capital. I, I take your point that if you bring in healthcare, that modifies the story. But here's the main, the question for us as a normative question is this. Whatever the details of that distribution have to be, A, are they a natural consequence of the functionings of the market? And B, are they just? Are they in any way morally justifiable? I think the answer is no. That's an absurd thing to bring up, to be honest with you. To, to, in a discussion about the structure of the American economy, you're going to talk about the handful of people who make big money out of sports. It is a favorite example of libertarians, and it does violence to the reality that 100 million people face in this country every day. Uh, not, just, not just yet. We will be taking questions in a moment. And actually, I've got a, a microphone set up in the back. Can I say one thing? Yes. Uh, I, I, virtually everything Mike said in his rebuttal, I, I really agreed with. Um, my question to Mike would be, and I don't know if this is the time to defend. Please, yeah. Mike says correctly, I think, that there's a failure of democracy 
because of the way in which these, these politicians have been bought off by the, by the wealthy, by the corporation. Barney Frank's a great example of this. And the flaws of Obamacare is a great example. And much of the left was, in fact, criticizing Obamacare for the reasons you say. You're right, it's a very authoritarian program. My only worry is this, Mike, which is, how can you not agree that it is an endogenous consequence of the massive inequalities in wealth and income that is gonna show up in that money being used to buy politicians? The whole essence of the left argument is that democracy starts to fail when you have these enormous concentrations of money in the economic sphere. They use that to then exert influence in the political sphere. So in principle, I totally agree with you that what we need to do is save democracy as a way of having a more rational regulation of the healthcare system, of infrastructure, et cetera, but without either a no enormous decrease in the inequality of wealth and without a counterweight to the power of the wealthy, which is labor and organized labor, I don't see how you can do that. Both of us have our own secret unicorn in the closet. So your secret unicorn is getting that legislation through a system that's largely controlled by the existing two-party systems and powerful corporations. We're not gonna be able to do that. I'm, I'm asking that existing elected members of Congress, I have to laugh even when I say it, because it's ridiculous, Existing members of Congress are gonna vote for a parliamentary system with proportional representation. That's no less ridiculous. Both of us have a ridiculous proposal. But both of us are also out here trying to talk to people to say, we need to rethink this in terms of solutions and solutions that at first seem ridiculous might, with explanation, start to become more plausible. One of the other areas in which I sense there probably is some significant disagreement between you, it has to do with your proposal to nationalize large segments of the American economy. Um, if I understood you correctly in your comments, you granted the traditional critique of central planning, sort of Soviet style, grand scale central planning. Why do you think the problems that beset central planning of the entire economy wouldn't also apply to central planning of large sectors of the economy? Or do you not envision it as central planning? No, it's going to be planning, largely because those parts of the economy are basically planned anyway. And even the private sector companies that oversee them have to have a fairly long investment cycle and a fairly long projection of what the growth in demand, et cetera, is going to be. And in those sectors, the growth in demand, growth in utilization, the, um, the kind of capital requirements that it takes are much easier to predict than they are in more volatile consumer sectors. All the sections of the economy that I said need to be nationalized and need to be planned in some way have in the past been successfully planned and successfully nationalized in capitalist economies in the past. So we have a wealth of experience to draw on there. Satisfied with that? Yes. <laughs> not what I expected you to say. <laughs> Do you, would you have a question before uh, Professor Chip before we turn things over to open question and answer? No. Okay. you're. <laughs> Making this easy. Okay, so we have an open question and answer period now. I'm going to uh, have people line up at the microphone in the back and ask that you use that microphone to ask a question, uh, not to make a speech, uh, not to make assertions, uh, but simply to ask a short, a short question and one that can be hopefully rather shortly answered. Uh, so yes, sir. Here's, that's the unicorn in the uh, closet there. Um, the last statement that was made by the defender of capitalism was that the problem was not the economy or the type of economics that we have, it's a type of political system. The question to me is, you know, are not the two of them one supporting the other? Aren't they in, in one sense uh, bound at the hip how can, there, how can there be a democratic system when capitalism allows the monopolization of every aspect of society right down to the buying and selling of, of politicians, of laws, uh, of everything? And the other aspect of that is one thing that was not mentioned here, is the tendency in... Um, a monopolistic international capitalist system, is there not the imperative to go to war 
wars of conquest that basically impoverish and send working people uh, to the front lines at the expense of international peace and the ability of peoples around the world to get some of the very kind of social equality that we were talking about. Thanks. Well, there, there, there were two questions, and one was about the tendency towards monopoly. If there are no impediments that are placed by the state, the tendency towards monopoly in large economies is relatively limited outside of the financial industry. I think we do have a problem with the financial industry, and so I would concede we need to break up the large financial firms. But the problems that I see of monopolization have almost all come about as a result of state protections that companies are able to buy. So it, it may be that my distinction between the capitalist system and the government system doesn't really hold up, but the question is which one are we going to try to fix first? I propose changing the democratic system. The empire question is one that often comes up. I agree that states profit from war. And it is also true that there are some large corporations that profit from being complicit with states in war. I don't know how to solve that problem, and I think that's one of the, I used to be a Republican until 2003, and in March 2003, two things happened. We invaded Iraq, and I had dinner with Rick Santorum. <laughs> and I thought, these are just not my people. I was, I was shocked when we invaded Iraq. And so I, I, I think that's a pathology of the US political system. There's, there's something larger at work than, than just our economic system. But I don't disagree that we seem to have that tendency. I do not think that it's a tendency of capitalism generally, because outside of the US, I don't see it. There are, there are many company, countries, Germany, Japan, that have been very successful capitalist countries that have very tiny armies. It, it is not necessarily a part of capitalism. Thank you, and just again, try to limit yourself in the name of the fair and equal distribution of questioning rights yeah. to one I'll, short question, please. I'll try to be really quick. Um, one observation uh, get leading down to a question. So, um, for the record, I'm a paleo-libertarian, minarchist, free market capitalist. There's some kind of to, crap on your hat. Yeah, yeah, I, that's exactly right. You know where that's from. Uh, the, the, the main question is, there's the labor theory of value and the marginal utility theory of value. I think that gets to the gentleman's question about Manny Machado. Could you both talk about your positions on which you believe in and why? Just for the record, my shirt says, uh, less Marx, more Mises. And just a quick audience poll. How many people know who Marx is? Raise a hand. How many people know who Mises is? There's a reason. You need to go out and you need to do a little more research. <laughs> or else they're that's right. the flip. That's the flip side. And I, to be honest, I met Mike out in the hallway. I'm not sure that Mike gave a really strong defense of capitalism, with all due respect. Uh, <laughs> Professor Chipper, we'll start with you on this one. <laughs> I'm a skeptic about the labor theory of value, and I think the marginalist theory has almost no credibility whatsoever. I think preferences and values are socially constructed, and that's what marginal utility theory says. So subjectivism means that what consumers want is what they want, and the labor theory of value, I just, I find uh, it's untenable. Yes, ma'am. I'm trying to stay out of the weeds of a lot of things. Um, I'm not. You should come closer to the mic. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm not an economist. I do politics as much as I can. Um, but I, I think it's difficult to follow a lot of this, although if I'm correct from what you say, is it Mike? What I heard you say is this almost isn't a good sign. It should be socialism and then democracy as a, as a sign. Because capitalism isn't kind of an economic thing. Socialism, as I see it, is kind of a, a theory of how we should live. 
It's got these words in them that are about inequality, social justice, to which I've never found a good definition. And so there's like theory and then there's um, democracy, one person, one vote. And I'm trying to clear this up because people talk about socialism and I hear a lot of theoreticals, but no practicalities. Democracy is a way of governing. And so I'm getting confused as to how we view this. To me, you had a more balanced approach, not unfettered capitalism. She called you unbalanced. <laughs> <laughs> She's not the first person. Well, and I've been called unbalanced, so we're together. Mike, did you, did you want to respond to, uh, uh, to what's been said here, have clear up the confusion? Uh, no, my job is to spread confusion. If, if <laughs> oh, you, don't do that. If, if, you, if you think you no longer know what socialism is because Sweden's a capitalist nation, I've done my job. Yeah. I, I never thought it was a socialist nation. I knew about that. And the other thing, one quick question. Did you say that in socialism, the media is run by the state? Did I hear that correctly? What, what I was saying is that in the United States in the future, privately run media is collapsing. And the only way out is going to be through some sort of publicly run, publicly funded media system. That's actually not something I'm advocating. I think that's going to happen. Okay, we're gonna, have, we're gonna have to turn thing over to the next questioner. Thank you very much. Hi there, I'm Derek Cassidy, president of the La Jolla Democratic Club. And uh, when I found out this afternoon, or no, a few days ago, that we were going to have this discussion today, I was amazingly excited. I cannot, I, I've been around 83 years. I don't recall another discussion in open, society like this. Uh, maybe there have been a couple, but mostly they've been in the Democratic Socialist Organization here in San Diego. Um, I, for our capitalist uh, panelists, and I can't, wish I could get your name straight. Mike. Okay, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I got that, I got that. So Mike, I, what I, my question is, we are on the brink of the end of civilization due to climate change. We are actually headed toward the end. Scripps Institution of Oceanography, right here in our town. Let's suppose you're right. You don't have to give evidence. Let's, for the sake of argument, let's suppose you're right. Oh, you agree with that? I agree that for the sake of argument, please ask your question. My question is, how can you support a system that brings this world to the brink of, of, of uh, the end of civilization? You, you, Good, thank you. <laughs> so you, 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 you mean... You mean democracy, because the yellow vests in France were all protesting the attempt to impose a carbon tax. So the, if you live in, a, now if you want to live in a fascist state where you get to decide what policies are, we could probably do it. I've, if, if I get to choose the leader, then it might work. The problem is that the short-sightedness that is inherent in democratic politics is what is leading us to climate change it is leading us to the inability to solve this problem. So I, I think you favor democracy. So do I. The question is how to solve this problem without imposing something that the elite thinks. The elites have lost their ability for reasons that may have to do with demagoguery to be able to persuade people about this. And it's not just in the United States, the yellow vests show that democracy is incapable of dealing with climate change. So if you're asking me how I support democracy, it's because that I think the alternatives are much worse. Um, my, my, I, sir, one hold second. On, hold on a second, Professor Chipper wants to respond. So this is an emerging disagreement between me and Mike. The reason there's no progress on climate change isn't because voters are confused. It's because politicians are bought by corporations. And the corporations... And this is the fundamental flaw in Mike's argument. I don't have a unicorn, Mike. I have a pretty good idea of how to get where we need to be. It's not gonna, take a, it's not gonna be a miracle. Your argument does suppose a miracle, which is elites come to their senses. My view is elites are doing entirely what's rational for them. Corporations are pursuing the bottom line. Their time horizon is of a few years. They don't give a shit by what happens 30 years down the line. They're trying to maximize their profits. If a politician proposes laws that's gonna get in the way, they buy them off, or they wage a campaign politically by, through an ocean of money that gets the, the politician unelected. Now, 
My view is not that miraculously better legislation is going to come around. I ended by saying it comes around through political struggle and through the organized mobilization of the poor, the people who are going to benefit from an actual democracy. I agree with you, we have to save democracy. But you cannot insulate the democratic process from the power of capital. You only do it by increasing the, the power of their opponents, which is working people, or by decreasing absolutely their latitude through taxation or through some kind of expropriation. I think this is an important issue worth spending a little bit more time on. So, uh, Professor Munger, do you want to respond to that at all? Sure. I've probably already said too much. Um, I often have debates with my Duke colleague, Dan Ariely, who wrote the book, Predictably Irrational, who talks about consumers' incapacity to make the choices that face them. The difficulty is that, as I said, every flaw in consumers is worse in voters. The problem with wanting free stuff, the problem with having a short time horizon, all of those things mean that in politics, we should expect all the same problems about short time horizons. The reason that a miracle is being invoked is that no political party is going to say, let's have a bunch of pain now for a benefit in the future. And as I said, the, 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 what happened in France was not a capitalist movement. The yellow vests were a protest by voters in response to a relatively small move that was going to have a tax on gasoline, which is a perfectly sensible response to climate change. Even that small change saw an immediate democratic response, a mass level social response where people went out and set things on fire. We cannot rely on voters to be any smarter than consumers are. This is a problem that human decision making has. And that's why it is a unicorn. All right, thank you. Next question, please. <clears throat> yeah, first off, um, I'm always amused to hear uh, socialists complain about government. It's kind of anyway, the question is, you know, Mike, I was cheering you on when you were um, um, arguing in favor of, of capitalism and market economics, except at the end when you supported or advocated democracy. It seems to me that democracy has, and market economics are mutually exclusive because democracy is command and control over other people's decision making and you know, the means of production and, and mutual exchange of, of value for value. Um, so would, an, would a more honest argument for market economics be to just abolish government absolutely 100% and privatize everything as it should be? Thank you. I, 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 don't, I don't know if that's a more honest argument. It certainly is a more extreme one. Um, the, 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 the sort of democracy that I envision is one where private property rights are protected by the Constitution. So there's a hierarchy of rights. And democracy has to be kept within its proper boundaries. The problem with politics is that, and this is, a, this is a fundamental view of public choice, the sort of political science and economics that I do, power expands. Power expands beyond where you want it, when you want it to stay. And so democratic power through the expansion of the Commerce Clause and the Constitution has been applied to a lot of things that contractually it should not have been. It's a very difficult contract to keep up. Still, democracy is the best of the bad alternatives. Next question, please. Uh, yeah, my question. Uh, uh, first, a little bit of my background. I've lived under 12 years of a communist revolution that started very similar to what Bernie and Ocasio and the left here, they started like easy going, easy sweezy. It started as socialism. And, and uh, first year, second, third year, there was two, uh, two terms or four years of the government that started on a socialist image, and it ended up full communist. It was a total failure. Anyway, with that experience, I have, I've lived it. I have, the, I've lived it. I'm not a theorist. You know, I'm not talking theory. He's pointing at us and saying and that's a bad thing. Not a theorist. Yeah, so theory. I'm not a theorist. I've actually lived it. You know, the, you know I've, I've been in it, embedded in a day, 24 hours. We, we believe you. Okay. <laughs> Just making it clear. Not a theorist. Uh, the, uh, so it, I'm also a small business guy in America. I came to America after the re leftist revolution because I ran away from socialism and communism, embracing once again the spirit of the founding father of America. And I said, this is where I want to be, God, for free, a middle class. That's, that's the solution. All right, uh, so I, I, you so, have a question. All right, so here we go. So my question is, when you, 
And, uh, and Amer what I, this is my observation as a conclusion. When you have a, a system that's already functioning, like America, you have a big middle class, you know, upper middle class, middle class, and lower middle class, and then you're going to have on this side, a, a there, there are people that are in poverty. They, have the, they still have a social uh, net, but they're still poverty with a social net to sustain them. So the, I think the plan now is to, it, we're already a massive deficit, so we can't grab money. We can't print more money to help this group here that has a social net. So how, wh my, my question is, if you think that you're going to grab, redistribute from the high standard of living, this, the, this group of people here, that a lot of these kids all want to be participants of, that, and it's reality because you can buy a lot of stuff in the consumer market society and have a stand, high standard of living, redistribute it to satisfy this risk, you try to bring it up a little bit, so you're going to go like this, you're going to go whammo here to create a, 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 so everybody is like this, so all the billionaires and the millionaires that are creating this group of people to consume and stuff to buy the So the question is, how, how are we going to pay for this? So my question is, once you destroy the system by redistributing to satisfy this group, and there, you, millionaires and billionaires are not going to want to invest and create jobs, uh -huh. then how are you going to, doesn't, socialism doesn't create wealth, it collapses. Okay. Because the, there's no, there's no, nobody, there's no incentive as a human being to risk, invest, create, add value, add it. Okay, so okay, let's. Everybody has stuff to. I think we, I think we work. got the idea, so let's. So what do you, what do you do? Where's the solution? <laughs> That was a that was a very energetically performed question. Uh, <laughs> let's see what uh, Professor Chipper has to say in response. <laughs> you can pantomime if you wish. The history of the advanced industrial countries from 1935 to 1980 or so is of massive redistribution from the wealthy to the poor. None of those countries imploded. None of them went off the deep end. In fact, it was the period of the highest growth rates, the highest rates of investment, and the highest rates of productivity growth we've ever seen. That's on this planet. I don't know what, which one you're talking about. It may be in the country which has gone unnamed, uh, that you're from, bad things happened. But since we're theorists, we have to look at the whole world and try to make some judgments based on that. Okay, well, <laughs> we could try again after the, uh, after the debate. Yes, sir. Okay. I, I endorse brief questions. Um, sorry, what? I endorse brief questions. Oh, good, good. Uh, I thought you said three questions, and I started to sweat a little bit. <laughs> uh, so, um, and I'd appreciate a response from both speakers. The phrase democratic socialism was only uttered from the podium once, but it, it does perplex me. It's, it's got to be a subset of socialism. Could both of you address what it means, democratic socialism, and then if you could ignore the second part of the question, can you apply that to, would that same analysis, that same distinguishing, uh, be able to distinguish between democratic fascism and fascism? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you asked me to ignore the second part, so I will. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what democratic socialism means, to be honest with you, and that's why I don't use the term. I think it's a term that Sanders has brought into the lexicon, and I think he's done it to distinguish what he's advocating for from what pops into people's minds. You have to remember Sanders is 77 years old, I think, and he's come out of an era where if you said socialism, some people said the gulag. And he uh, is, you know, he's in the country where, as Matt said, 30 years ago, if you said I stand for socialism, people would say, well, why do you hate people? Why, why do you want a dictatorship? Uh, why do you want to destroy our freedoms? This is a country with 60 years of unrelenting propaganda against the idea of socialism. So I think what Sanders has done is he's brought in the term democratic socialism partly as a way of distinguishing himself from the particular tradition of Stalinism and dictatorships that was handed down from the Russian Revolution. But I also think that there is a substantive difference between Sanders' democratic socialism and socialism as traditionally conceived, which is Sanders, when he says democratic socialism, really means social democracy. What he's actually talking about is what uh, Mike was talking about, some kind of Nordic 
Danish, Swedish model or something like that. Um, it, should that be called democratic socialism at all? Yeah, in, or socialism of any kind. I, I think so in the following way. While it still remains within the ambit of capitalism, as uh, Mike said, getting there from here, first of all, requires political strategies that are the strategies of the traditional socialist left, because all of these countries, which we now call social democracies, became that way through massive trade union and labor struggles. It was one road leading to all of them. It was the labor movement, which was led by socialists and by communists everywhere. Secondly, they do embody a certain principle that even though they remain within capitalism, strictly speaking, they are much less capitalistic in a variety of ways than, say, the United States is. So if you were to think of capitalism to socialism as a continuum, where at some point in it there's a qualitative break, in that continuum they are much closer to that qualitative break than the United States is today. They are much closer to the socialist end of it. So I, I think that the term is slightly misleading, although justifiable given the perversity of American political culture, uh, but also not entirely, I think, fictitious, because there is a substantive essence content to democratic socialism that brings it closer to socialism as traditionally conceived. I would say democratic socialism is trying to put lipstick on an ugly pig, because you're saying that we're going to decide what prices will be based on majority rule. And prices reflect relative scarcities of resources. There are problems with externalities or problems with market failures. All that aside, prices have to be free to, well, to find out what the relative scarcity of resources are. Deciding what prices are by voting, as Seattle has recently done, by raising its minimum wage to $15. The study just came out of the University of Washington from Jacob Vigder, where the number of hours worked by young and experienced people has fallen by 30%. We can't just vote and say we want higher wages. The effect of that works through economic physics. And so democratic socialism is just trying to make a, an ugly pig a little bit prettier with some paint. It's not possible. I think we have time for just one more question, unfortunately. Uh, I am a student, so I can ask my question, hopefully. Um, it's a weighty responsibility. I'll try to be quick. So full, dis full disclosure, I have never lived in a socialist country. I've grown up in the United States. I am very lucky to say that I am currently enjoying the benefits of free market capitalism by sitting in this room with all of you who also enjoy the benefits of it. And there is yet to be, it's in my time, um, in my educational career, I'm only a freshman, so there's still time, but in my time, I've never heard of another system that creates wealth um, so efficiently and effectively while maintaining individual and personal liberty and freedom of choice as capitalism. And my question really is one of two things. One, if we embraced socialism as our purveyor of socialism has suggested today, um, how would we still properly incentivize the next generation of individuals to innovate, create, and enter markets that already exist to create even more wealth uh, like what we've experienced up till this point? And two, um, for Dr. Munger, um, you talked briefly, very briefly, about re, like, uh, rehauling American democracy. If you could just briefly like try to give me a recap of what that would look like, I guess. As opposed to cronyism, which I do see as a very real problem. Thank you, well. thank you. It helps to read economic history. If you look at the countries that have gone the furthest with high taxation rates, high wages, the regulation of industry, et cetera, there has been no drop-off in investment rates. There has been no drop-off in labor market participation when wages have gone up. In fact, labor market participation in Nordic countries, and some of them is higher than it is in the United States right now. It does surprise me a little bit when I give these talks to see people asking questions like this as if there's no research on it. It really does help to look at the facts around this. And while we do not know what something like a market socialism would do to investment rates and to rates of innovation. What we do know is this, that the most advanced social democracies of the kind that I've been advocating for as a minimum baseline for where we want to go 
have not had systematic failures on this score. And secondly, you really need to be clear on something. Most of the innovation in America doesn't come from the private sector. It comes from the public sector, from universities, from government, massively subsidizing what the private sector does. The private sector steps in at the very end of this process in what's called process innovation. Libertarians need to at least acknowledge this and then figure out where to go from there. Mike, if you, uh, if you chime in, I think we have one for one more question after this. Uh, the first thing I would do is, is get rid of primaries and have parties nominate with conventions so that they would actually be responsible for the choices they had to make, because the primary system means that the parties have no control and therefore have no responsibilities. Thank you very much. One last student question. And Thank then you. Have to um, so I want to speak very plainly and very directly. So I want to invite everyone to think. So question one, how can we stop going everywhere and nowhere at the same time? Question two, how can we no longer prioritize playing the game of Monopoly? Monopoly is the world's popular, most popular board game. Can we stop using that as a framework on how the world is supposed to exist, coexist? And then the third question is, if we're going to continue to play this game of monopoly, uh, thinking in the board, you know, the board game, the boardroom, can we start putting our money where our mouth is? Because that game, anyone who is okay with playing that game of monopoly, it's shown me that in some ways you have the mind of an oppressor. Someone who gets to roll the dice, control who gets what, you stop on this, you stop at the jail cell, you stop on the light, you get, you collect, you go. So can we stop using that as an analogy so that we can stop going everywhere, nowhere at the same damn time? Literally, if you've ever played that game before, how long does it take for someone to win? Who enjoys playing Monopoly in this room? I will show you who you are, and I will call you out for who you are. You are, you are the reason why we're in these spaces. And so I wanted to add that as another representation. I'm one of only, in my family, thank God, glory be to God, in 100 years, I will be the first person in my family within 70 year span. The question is, why am I the first in my family in 70 years to be the first bachelor degree and master's degree holder when I had about 10 things impeding on me getting here? Okay, so mental okay. health, housing, and so on. So how can we stop going everywhere and nowhere at the same time? Okay, so let me, let me give our speakers a chance to respond. Uh, Professor Munger? Professor Chibber? Not sure I understood the question. Because um, it's like freed men and free men talking. Okay, you both have a lot of great points. Great points. Freed men and free men talking right now. Capitalism and socialism. They're both going everywhere and nowhere. It's, we need each other okay. to agree. Thank you very much. I think we're going to have to conclude on that note. Uh, so thank you to all of you for coming out for this afternoon's debate. Uh, As I said, I hope you walk away from this uh, event, as with all our events, with a better understanding of both your own position and the position of the other side. Uh, we've got a regular debate series, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, one debate each semester. So if you'd like to stay signed up and aware of future events, uh, you can do that by subscribing to our mailing list on the website indicated above, or just send me an email address and I'll get you signed up that way. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great evening. Uh -huh.